Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, <clears throat> so the title of the talk might seem perverse. Uh, Osborne keeps telling us that this is the fifth largest economy in the world uh, and it's growing strongly. Uh, and you might ask, what's that got to do with underdevelopment? And particularly, what do the ideas of a largely forgotten economist from the 60s uh, have to do with that? And these are, I think, reasonable questions. and. I'm basically not going to answer them in any full way, but hope to provoke and to ask at least to see whether you think the questions are reasonable. And I'll do this in three parts. First, a short account of Andre Gunder Frank's work where, who, who coined the phrase. Uh, <coughs> secondly, a short discussion, or perhaps not so short discussion, of how far we might see his theses as applicable to the UK, in which I conclude that at least it throws some interesting light on what is happening in the UK, perhaps as interesting as anything Mr. Osborne had to say in his speech in the autumn. And lastly, a short discussion of why, to the extent that these ideas do shed interesting light on what's happening, few people look at this country, or perhaps any country uh, much now through the optic of Andre Gunder Flank. Now a few words about him. He died in 2005 and I'm told that at the memorial for him in Oxford the chief eulogist couldn't think of anything nice to say about him as a person. I also remember meeting someone who had worked with him in Chile who hated him because he would ring her up at two in the morning with a new idea, ask her opinion of it. Uh, and there's no doubt he was self-absorbed and difficult, uh, a bit confrontational, uh, but he was also charming and could be stimulating, and I only knew him a bit at the, towards the end of his life, and I never had to put up with him for very long, but I, I liked him. As a young economist trained in Chicago, he set about offering a root and branch attack on the American theory of development that dominated the time, modernization theory. The idea that underdeveloped countries were or, or were still in or still close to a once original state, a state that developed countries had once been in themselves and that to become developed they had to pass through a series of stages with the help of benevolent aid from the developed countries until they too arrived at what Rostow called high mass consumption society a view which sometimes, sometimes strikes me as relatively alive and well uh, <coughs> in official circles in this country. He pointed out that throughout recorded history, <coughs> Latin America had been deeply marked by subordination to external powers. And for him, the term underdeveloped was not a euphemism for poverty as it was for the World Bank for a while, or a label for a low level of development. For him, it meant subordinate development. And if all he'd done was to <coughs> propose this way of conceptualizing development, he would not have made a stir, but he considered it his scientific and political duty to demonstrate in considerable detail just how modernization theory was wrong. And his long 1966 article, Sociology of Development, Underdevelopment Sociology of Sociology, was a closely argued demolition of the leading lights of modernization theory at the time, from Tolkien Parsons through Everett Hagen, Daniel Lerner, Bert Hoselitz, Walt Roslow, Rostow, and David McClellan. And by implication, it was therefore also a critique of most of the work of American academics who were working on development at that time. And this was not calculated to make him popular. The collective academic response in the USA was not to review his books. If students nonetheless got hold of them and thought they made sense, the response in academia was to dismiss him or indeed the student concerned. And I witnessed this myself at the, uh, <coughs> at the tail end of the 50s. We were living in a post-McCarthy atmosphere in which denouncing people for their uh, allegedly socialist views 
was enough to uh, earn you good marks. So what are the main elements of, is that going to do it? There is Andre Gunder Frank, as he was in the last 10 years of his life. And here are the main elements of his thesis. <coughs> the extraction <coughs> it really has three elements. One is the notion of the extraction of surpluses. Secondly, the structuration of the local economy for the purposes of external capital. Reliance on cheap, unskilled or low-skilled labor, limited internal markets, dependence on the production of a small range of primary products for export, making the economy vulnerable to adverse terms of trade, enclaves of high consumption elites in the capital consuming imported goods, and a transport system geared to export and limiting production for the internal market. And thirdly, the formation of a local class whose interests are aligned with those of external capital, so-called comprador class. <coughs> The business wing of this class facilitated capital's exercise of economic or market power, while its political wing facilitated foreign capital's control of the state, a combination captured in the label Banana Republic. On the second point of this thesis, the structure of a typical underdeveloped country, there was little argument. Dependence on unskilled labor, <coughs> low levels of literacy, and education, a limited inter internal market, and so forth, were agreed to be problems to overcome. The difference between Frank and the mainstream was over the causes. The modernization schools saw these economic structures as the result of original conditions, and their societies, and their societies as being still enthralled to traditional ascribed rather than achieved roles. In contrast, Frank and his Latin American colleagues saw nothing original or innate in the situation, they saw the economy and society as shaped by the extraction of surplus. For them, the key feature was the extraction of surplus, whereas for modernization theorists, the solution to underdevelopment was to supply capital and know-how from abroad, they pointed out that there was actually a net outflow of capital from Latin America to the United States in particular, and moreover, that a large part of the inward investment in Latin America was reinvested surplus from the local operations of foreign companies. And if this idea is now part of common sense, it wasn't at the time, and Frank played a significant part in popularizing and getting it understood. As for a comprador class, here the difference was fundamental. The modernizers saw the educated businessmen, politicians, and civil servants of the former colonies as elites who needed support and training to enable them to modernize their countries. Frank saw them as a local ruling class whose interest lay not in modernizing the national economy, but in making money by assisting, or at least not opposing, capital and accumulation and capital export by foreign companies. If development was to replace underdevelopment, this class needed to be replaced by a popular class alliance, an alliance of classes with an interest in national development. A key element in this putative alliance of classes was to be the so-called progressive national bourgeoisie. Progressive in two senses. First, in the historical sense of a capitalist class seeking to replace feudal or other pre-capitalist relations of production with capitalist relations, and so transforming the productive potential of the country. And second, and therefore, also progressive in a political sense of being ready to make alliances with the peasantry and wage workers in order to overcome the political power of the comprador class. This account of Frank's concept of underdevelopment is, of course, totally simplified and stylized, but my aim is not to ask how valid it was for that era, but to ask if it could shine any light on the situation in Britain today. Does it make any sense to see the UK as underdeveloped in the sense that Frank was using. Obviously, this is not a country with a large, low-paid, low unskilled rural workforce. It doesn't lack a domestic market capable of making industrial production profitable. Its transport system was not geared to the export of primary commodities. It never used to be underdeveloped, 
On the contrary, it was an active underdeveloper of other countries, as Walter Rodney put it in his book, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. But it's hardly controversial that after 1945, Britain ceased to play the role of a metropole to other countries and itself became increasingly a satellite of the USA, what Lenin would have called a quasi-colony, but what in polite circles is called the special relationship. But has this role reversal led to the development of underdevelopment in the UK? Is there any insight to be gained from asking this question? Before trying to answer it, I want to make a brief digression. We should remind ourselves that such a reversal of roles from metropole to satellite is something Frank himself came to consider a normal, indeed constant, feature of world history. After moving from Latin America to Europe in 1973, following the coup in Chile, he no longer focused exclusively on the problems of ex-colonial countries. Instead, he came to see the whole of world history as an unending sequence of successive metropolis satellite systems, from formal empires to informal systems of tribute and unequal exchange, such as Britain's so-called empire of free trade, to today's informal American financial empire. In 1995, he summed up his worldview as follows. I now find the same continuing world system, including its center-periphery structure, hegemony, rivalry, competition, and cyclical ups and downs, has been evolving, question developing, for 5,000 years at least. In this world system, sectors, regions, and peoples, temporarily and cyclically, assume leading and hegemonic central or core positions of social and technological development, they then have to cede their pride of place to new ones who replace them. So Frank would have had no problem with the idea that the UK has now become an underdeveloping and perhaps underdeveloped country. On the contrary, he not only looked at it that way himself, but reported that it was his teenage son who noticed it first. And he wrote in a memoir in that year. In 1979, soon after we'd arrived in England from Germany, my younger son, Miguel, observed England is an underdeveloping country. I ran to my class to tell my British students who were incredulous. After several years of British deindustrialization under the government of Mrs. Thatcher, I repeated Miguel's early observation to a later generation of students who reacted then, of course. Okay, so let's now look uh, at Britain a little bit through the optic of Frank's thesis. As far as I know, Frank never did this systematically and I don't intend to either, but the question is, does that framework illuminate what is going on or has been going on here since 1945? And to do that, I ask basically three questions derived from Frank's model. How far is surplus being extracted? How far is the structure marked by underdevelopment? And how far can the British ruling class be understood as a comprador class? So first, on the issue of surplus extraction, here is from the Office for National Statistics, the percentage of UK stock market owned by foreigners over the years from 1963 to 2014. And by 2014, more than half of it was foreign owned. And within that half, 46% was owned by Americans. <coughs> then there's the question of takeovers. Of course, there were lots of foreign companies operating in Britain from Ford and General Motors to Colgate and Starbucks and Goldman Sachs. <coughs> but there are also many companies which we think of as <coughs> British companies which have passed into foreign hands, including quite a few household names. Of course, British capitalists also own companies in foreign countries. <coughs> and that graph, also from ONS, represents the <coughs> difference between value of assets owned by British capitalists abroad and those in Britain owned by foreign capitalists. And 
with the exception of two th a spike in 2009, it's been negative since the 90s. <coughs> but since the 1980s, these holdings <coughs> uh, by British capitalists abroad have been significantly smaller than foreign foreigners' holdings in Britain, and the gap is equivalent to about a quarter of British GDP. It's pretty substantial. And in the last few years, the rate of return on the foreign assets of British investors has been lower than the return to foreign owners of British as uh, assets. And this helps, according to the ONS, to account for the dip in, that, uh, in the red graph, which is investment income, in the years since the crash, 20, uh, since 2011, and which shows up in the extremely adverse uh, current account. The green, the green line uh, <coughs> on that chart, which is now down <coughs> at an annual deficit in overall on current account of 5% of GDP, which means annual essentially borrowing from abroad at a massive scale, which clearly is not sustainable in the long run. Essentially, what it's saying is that Britain is a debtor nation on a grand scale. I'll come back to the role of debt in a moment. But to finish with the question, issue of surplus extraction, I, I'm not an economist, and I don't know if there is a net outflow of surplus from the UK economy. Perhaps someone here can tell us. But it doesn't seem absurd to think that something like the central element of underdevelopment as conceived by Frank might apply here today. OK, secondly, now moving to the structure of the economy. Of course, our economy bears no resemblance to a classical ex-colonial, ex-third world economy of the kind that Frank and other underdevelopment theorists were looking at in the 60s, although that might make an interesting set of comparisons to explore. <coughs> For example, <coughs> the economy doesn't rely primarily on a mass of unskilled labor, but you could see the steady growth <coughs> of a large unemployed or underemployed and precarious segment of the workforce as forming part of the global pool of surplus labor, which is gradually setting a new globally determined subsistence wage. In mid-2015, 1.8 million people were unemployed and looking for work, and of those who are counted as being in work, over a quarter have part-time jobs, and 1.4 million of these are working part-time because full-time work isn't available. And this is also true of the many among the 16% of who are in work and who are self-employed. <coughs> Some of these effectively have left the labor market but are recorded as, regard themselves and are recorded as self-employed. And average self-employed earnings have fallen by a fifth since 2008. But that's a somewhat of a digression. The most obvious structural feature of the UK economy is the dominant role of finance concentrated in the city of London, the world's largest currency transaction centre and the second largest bond trading sector. The city of London <coughs> itself is now predominantly foreign owned. 11 of the largest 14 investment banks, three of the five biggest retail banks are foreign owned and most of the staff at Canary Wharf are foreign. In this context, it's important to remind ourselves that the City of London, the financial district, is not integrated into the British economy. Lending to British, economy, British companies is not a significant part of its business. It's a global financial centre that happens to be located here. It might as well be located in Paris or Qatar or anywhere with good IT services from a technical point of view. It is counted as part of the UK economy for good reasons, for statistical purposes too, and this gives a misleading impression of the strength of the rest of the UK economy. The financial sector accounts for 10% of GDP. If we took the City of London and its supply chain out of it, the weaknesses in the rest of the economy would become clearer. The transformation of the City of London into this global financial centre is recent. It had existed for 300 years as the financial centre of the British Empire, but in 1986 the Thatcher government decided to convert it 
into an international financial center for the new global economy. And it was able to do this primarily by subjecting it to weaker regulation than New York, Hong Kong, or Tokyo, and so giving it an advantage. It was already an offshore center for so-called euro dollars. It now expanded dramatically and also became increasingly corrupt as evidenced by a series of scandals from the rigging of LIBOR, the insurance protection racket, and the rigging of the foreign exchange market. <coughs> Regulation continues to be weak. The manipulation of foreign exchange alone is estimated to have cost British pensioners 7.5 billion pounds a year over 10 years, yet no one has gone to jail. The UK is now also recognized as a global hub for laundering criminal money and with its various island dependencies is an offshore tax haven on a grand scale too. So while the UK is not a banana republic, we could perhaps call it an offshore monarchy, which to my mind is almost more embarrassing. From a socio-economic point of view too, the City of London is also an enclave like the post-colonial capitals and mining enclaves of Africa and Latin America, becoming home <coughs> to a leading, <coughs> sorry, becoming a home to the, a leading global financial centre is turning central London into a distinctive habitus of luxury living with a service workforce commuting in from the outer edges and beyond, like the service classes that commute daily from the townships of Johannesburg and the favelas of Rio. In another echo of the original underdevelopment literature, we could also see the public transport system beginning to be underdeveloped to serve this enclave rather than the needs of the national economy. For example, the debate over Crossrail and HS2 rather than having a modernized rail system for the ex-industrial north. So at many points then we find the UK's economic structure marked by the dominance of the City of London which is largely foreign owned and it's hard to think of a major field of economic or social policy that doesn't reflect the city's influence. Its opposition to tax reform in general and specifically to a financial taxation transaction tax and reform of the taxing of multinationals, its opposition to curbs on the bonus culture and its role in pr promoting grotesque levels of income inequality, its demand for a reduction in state spending. It seems to me reasonable to conclude that the UK's economic structure does reflect underdevelopment very much in the way that Frank understood it in Latin America in the 1960s. So next, is the ruling class a comprador class? The simplest way to answer this question is to notice the almost complete lack of a class of progressive national capitalists in the United Kingdom. It's hard to name a single businessman, banker or politician who thinks foreign ownership of the economy is problematic. <coughs> the r a rare exception to this is Alex Brummer, the city editor of the Daily Mail, in his book, Britain for Sale, published in 2012, he wrote that he thought he was detecting a change of opinion in ruling class circles. But he could cite at that time the names of only two or three people who had begun even tentatively to be concerned about the implications for the future of allowing control of the economy to pass so comprehensively into foreign hands. Everyone else was positively <coughs> enthusiastic about it. Yet, as Brummer points out, control is everything. He quotes an engineer, Sir Alan Rudge, who argues as follows. Why does ownership matter? As those who have experienced corporate life will readily recognize the key issues linked to ownership are those of basic control. Ownership inevitably affects strategy, investment, taxes, and where they are paid, employment, <coughs> procurement, group synergies, research and development, stock exchange listing, diversification and location of operations, choice of products and markets, and prospects for senior management. <clears throat> the location and culture of the controllers of the business are important and will over time have a fundamental impact on the future of the business, to which one could only add not just the future of the business. If a wide range of businesses are foreign owned, 
it is the future of the society that is also at stake. If capitalists are not concerned with what their decisions mean for the rest of society, or even the overall productivity of the economy as a whole, and if state enterprise is ruled out, the negative consequences of, are unavoidable. What's more, if businesses with significant technological assets pass into foreign hands, the effect is like the impact of foreign ownership <coughs> in colonial economies, leaving them dependent on lower value-added production. <coughs> and there are some recent takeovers listed by Brummer of high-tech uh, companies <coughs> in this country. The situation with patents is interesting too. In 2012, 14% of all European Union patients patents, excuse me, were foreign-owned. 12% of US patents were foreign-owned. 39% of UK patents are foreign-owned. And yet foreign companies only accounted for 13% of the research and development done in the UK. In other words, the social benefits of the exploitation of those UK patents were, were, were felt abroad. <coughs> Foreign ownership also plays some part in the low level of investment in the UK relative to other comparable countries. Britain's rate of investment, that's the <coughs> yellow line at the bottom in the chart, has been consistently behind that of comparable economies. Also striking is the way in which successive British governments have allowed the country's infrastructure <coughs> as well as its productive sectors to pass <coughs> into foreign hands, including into the hands of foreign states. Many of the foreign companies that now own important parts of Britain's infrastructure are themselves partly or even wholly owned by foreign governments. Electrical engineers joke that London's electricity supply has now been renationalized only not by the British government, but by the French government, which owns EDF. Does this matter? I can't go into it now, but there's strong evidence that what these utilities do is provide a hugely profitable monopoly for fast-footed global management companies and finance advisors at the expense of British households. James <coughs> Meek's book, Private Island, contains a pretty good analysis of how it works in some sectors. Since the financial crisis of 2007 to 8, governments have belatedly realized that Britain's extreme dependence on financial services makes its economy vulnerable. Financial services are our monocrop. They have all called for a rebalancing of the economy, by which they mean a revival of manufacturing exports. Mr. Osborne has called for a march of the makers and the development of a northern powerhouse. But the government has very little power to bring this about unless it's willing to create publicly owned manufacturing enterprises, which of course is anathema to neoliberal thinking. Several quite sympathetic reviews in the Financial Times and the Times of the policies so far adopted to stimulate a march of the makers <coughs> have found no measures that hold out a prospect of accomplishing this. The reality is that foreign owners of companies with serious surpluses, and there are some very large ones in the corporate sector at the moment, are not interested in rebalancing the British economy or reviving the ex-industrial north. They're only interested in what is profitable. If they're at all influenced by political pressure to preserve or create jobs or to pay their share of taxes, it will be pressure from the governments of the countries where their companies are headquartered and that's where they will do it there. So is the UK ruling class a comprador class? Other OECD countries have capitalist classes that are somewhat more national in outlook. France, Germany, Italy, Spain, Japan, and not least the USA, all bar foreign ownership of any enterprise that is considered important to national security or in some sense strategic. And what's considered strategic can be quite flexible. The French government famously designated the yogurt maker Danone as a strategic company to prevent it being bought by PepsiCo. Whereas when Kraft made its bid for Cadbury, the UK government offered no resistance. <coughs> 
It's hard not to conclude that the British ruling class plays a significant role in the kind of development Britain is experiencing, as Frank's thesis would suggest. You might say it's comprador and proud of it. <clears throat> so there is the case, I think. It's not unreasonable to think that since 1945 at least, the UK has experienced something like the development of underdevelopment. Its circumstances when this process began were very different from those of Latin America in the 60s, but once it began, the process has had some comparable effects. Britain's economic and social development has increasingly depended on external forces, reflecting external ownership of key economic assets. And although the dominant external forces are heavily concentrated in the USA, the, underdevelop <coughs> the underdeveloper is less and less a single country, a single metropole, but rather the global owners of investable capital, wherever they're based. This may prove to be an important difference from Frank's metropole satellite concept, but the effects so far don't look that dissimilar. Now finally, if I'll be allowed injury time, to just say a little bit about, a little bit about <coughs> why nobody thinks like this now, or not many anyway. There are many objections that can be raised to this way of looking at the UK. I'm not out to champion it, but it isn't obvious <coughs> that the questions it poses are unimportant. In my view, it at least deserves to be considered. So I find it interesting that so few commentators today draw on a thesis which seems to me relevant to the study of development in Britain, or perhaps anywhere. And I wonder why this is. This question could be addressed at several levels. To my mind, there is one fundamental reason. Frank's original problematique of the development of underdevelopment rested on the assumption that there were alternatives to the economic system that produced it, as represented in practice by the Soviet Union, China, Cuba, and a range of variations elsewhere. But these actually existing alternative economic systems <coughs> have been discredited and abandoned, and no seemingly realizable new alternative has been proposed. Underdevelopment has instead become a worldwide phenomenon, even if it's not identified as such, and the problems it causes tend to be seen as largely insuperable. <clears throat> what are the reasons for that? Well, one reason is obvious. The degree of global integration makes it difficult to imagine any purely national alternative. Another is that everyone is acutely aware of the strength of the political forces that can be deployed in support of the interests of the owners of investable funds. But in my view, the immediate constraint, at least for Western democracies, lies in the radical change in the nature of representative government that has resulted from the combination of capital mobility and state indebtedness. <clears throat> the best analysis of this I've read is Wolfgang Strake's book, Buying Time. Strake's fundamental insight is to focus on the active political role <clears throat> of the global collective of owners of large sums of capital. From the 1980s onwards, they were able to secure a steady reduction in their taxes to make up for the resulting shortfall in revenue and to avoid alienating voters by reducing public services and welfare provision and increasing taxes on them instead, although that happened too, governments started borrowing from the people they used to tax. Meanwhile, the owners of capital had also secured the freedom to move their funds wherever in the world the returns are highest. The result is that in any given country, the owners of investable funds are like a second electorate, parallel to the electorate proper. Whereas the resident population exercise power by voting every four or five years, the owners of capital exercise power by varying the rate of interest they require for lending their money to the state. And they do this on a monthly basis at the bond auctions through which the state keeps renewing the public debt. At any time they think the state may do something they fear could make their money less safe, they raise the rate of interest they charge. 
These creditors of the state are in a stronger position than voters. They vote every month at the auctions and they can take their money elsewhere, whereas voters are stuck. Moreover, to get them to lend at any given rate, you need the confidence of all the lenders. But to win elections under the British electoral system, especially, you only need the support of a minority of the electorate. In the 2015 election, just 24%. So retaining the confidence of the bond markets, <coughs> standard euphemism for the creditors, has become almost more important than retaining the support of voters. What this means is that underdevelopment is now a common condition of most countries. The only countries which are not chronically subordinate in the new global capitalist system are those where the state is not dependent on debt countries with strong export sectors and a positive balance of payments, such as Germany, and with ruling classes determined to use this freedom not to give up the freedom of action this provides. But for all other countries, as governments seek to balance the conflicting demands of the creditors and their voters, it would seem futile to ask the kinds of question that Frank originally posed. <coughs> But if that is the case for most countries, what is the study of <coughs> development in most of them about? Development country uh, studies were originally distinguished as an academic field by a strong commitment to change, to improvement on a radical scale. Do we now have to say that this is no longer possible? That the study of development must now consist simply of identifying the limits within which any country can vary the terms of its ongoing structural adjustment to the requirements of the bond markets. That's it. Thanks very much, Colin. That's very thought-provoking. Um, so we'll open it up uh, for questions. I think we'll take um, three or four questions. Is that OK? And then, uh, and then Colin can come back. Um, at regular intervals. So just raise your hand um, and you can ask your question. Yes. A, a very minor point, but Land Rover is now owned by an Indian company and not German. It's a big slide you put up on Land Rover, but it's been taken over by Canada, so you know, which is even more humiliating for a once proud imperial country. Perhaps, yes. Okay, thanks. Yes, Alfredo. Um, two um, <coughs> connected issues. One, how do you distinguish between the internationalization of the British economy and then of any other comparable economy and the underdevelopment of this economy? So what isn't Britain just more internationalized than others by the expected show rather than being subordinate to uh, others in the export <coughs> Others. Also connected to this, how do you avoid the uh, menace, the threat, the possibility of a methodologically nationalist point of view where Britain has to be defended from foreign attack for some reason that we need to explain? Um. Sorry, I should have announced the, the uh, just on a completely different topic, not a completely different topic, but the, 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 the Twitter. Um, if you're on, if you're tweeting, the, the hashtags are SOAS Dev Studies, you probably already know, um, and ESRC if you're, if you're tweeting. So I'll take this person over here and then you. Okay. I, I, I mean, I find the argument convincing. I find your argument convincing, but I don't know what political position can can, can <coughs> critique that without falling into a nationalism. I yeah. Mean, uh, I think if you draw up uh, assets and liabilities, <coughs> if you only look at one side, you're going to get a very one-sided result. And the economic analysis you're given of the character of the British economic establishment is incredible. I mean, if you look at mergers and acquisitions, then also has to look at the acquisitions of 
British companies in the United States and elsewhere in the world. Um, if you're looking at uh, major companies outside the finance sector, no mention at all of oil companies, mining companies, the extractive sector, and their relationship with finance, and the amount of surface value which is being drained from all over the world to Britain through these uh, companies, uh, and so on and so forth. Right? I mean, the one point I do find agreement with the thesis you're arguing is the power of the financial sector, and that is crucial particularity of Britain, but it is also particularly linked with the military power of the British state, which again is an aspect of are we an underdeveloped country or not, which is completely missing from the analysis. If we're talking about political economy, the financial power and the military power of Britain are the two most, uh, you know, strongest particularities of Britain. Okay, thanks. Do you want to take those um, and, and then we'll take another round? <coughs> I think my, my response to Alfredo would <coughs> probably be internationalization equals underdevelopment if you can't control how it, uh, how it plays out. In other words, if, it's, if, it's, if you simply open your economy up to purchase by, by any, any, of any sector, you must pay the price socially. So then the question is, is it nationalist and is that a ba wrong kind of nationalism to be concerned about the social consequences of what foreign owners of the economy will do? And my, my view is it is a problem, it absolutely is a problem. I may, I may, that may not be what you are now. Frankly, I, I didn't get your second, your second question. Could you repeat it? No, that I don't remember. Okay. <laughs> methodological <laughs> nationalism? The, oh, the methodological, okay, met methodological and nationalism in the in the analysis and then but similar to what others have asked what are the uh, implications of that uh, politically or in terms of economic policy? well the question also about UKIP uh, <coughs> uh, raises the same question I mean we did we live in nations yeah uh, at the level of social and economic life we organize these through governments which are in as in the case of the European Union, but also through regional and other arrangements, are not completely unconstrained in what they do. But they have, as, as representative governments, the prime responsibility for the welfare of the people who live in it. So the question, is it a bad kind of nationalism that a government should have those concerns? It is, you can call it nationalism, or you can call it a preoccupation with national security or national welfare or equality at the national level. And so there's, it seems to me to, to say, as a, a telling point, say people would not like to talk about nationalism if they think it was UKIP, and most people would not. I mean, nationalism has a bad name for obvious historical reasons, but anti-nationalism at the level of the way it's being handled by uh, successive British governments, absolutely indifferent to if Cadbury's, for example, is sold by a company that promises to retain breaks the promises it had to the workers within weeks of completing the purchase. Was that something the government should not have been interested in? Was it was it in our in the popular in the national interest that that should happen? And would it would it be considered a bad kind of nationalism to resist that? I'd, my feeling is it 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 wouldn't. On, on the wider point that's made at the back, I, I I don't pretend to say to offer an analysis of the flows of capital and, and the flows of surpluses. What is interesting, I mean, your point about oil extraction and other forms of extractive industry is a valid one. I mean, it's quite interesting that of the top 20 companies in the FTSE 100, only two are manufacturing. Uh, and the, the implications of that for domestic employment are significant. So that's the point that I'm making is, should a government be concerned about the social and economic impact of a completely open economy. In my view is it should be. In my view is that they actually are, but they haven't done very much about it. They haven't thought, thought very well about it. Other questions? Yes. Would you, would you consider then, that like in an internationalized kind of setting, that what is actually happening is that, that rather, because you talk about London and the focus of London on finances, that in fact, what's happening is rather than um, 
national and the development. What's kind of happening is the development of London specifically is then in turn underdeveloping the rest of the UK. So the government's focus from just being within London is what's causing wider underdevelopment rather than selling away. They're just trying to develop one particular part of the UK which is causing underdevelopment elsewhere. Well, I think it's a knock on effect of the policy of creating the financial sector sector and subordinating everything to the interests of that sector. At a certain point, the attractive power of that development does drain resources away from elsewhere. And what is striking is that the government has it in its power to do something to offset that, but has chosen on the whole not to. And that choice is rationalized in various ways economically, but it's also very clearly in the interests of people who finance the Conservative Party, which is 50% from the City of London. So, I mean, th that's not a very profound comment, but I mean, that is in fact what exactly what Frank meant by a comprador relationship. Yeah. And then you. Sorry. Hi. Um, a question about uh, in and out um, of the EU in the light of uh, things that you just said. Would you think that sort of a strategy of leaving the for the UK to leave the EU would be um, a way of reclaiming ownership or sort of um, targeting some of the issues that you talked about, sort of being exposed to the international influences? I don't see that at all. Uh, I don't see how leaving the EU would enhance our capacity to resist Amazon. I mean, it's a matter of opinion, but that's, if you ask me my opinion, that's what I think. I mean, I think in this, so it, that comes close to the point of, if I, if I, if I were to take the position you, you offer me, I, it would come close to the position of people who see Brussels as the problem and are quite content to see sovereignty pass into the hands of multinational companies. And I don't, I don't see that. I mean, I'm not a fanatic uh, defender of all the structures of the European Union, let alone of the Euro, but I think we're much better off in terms of the very issues that we're to I've been trying to talk about in it. Um, you had a question over there, yep. Yes, uh, Professor. Uh, my name is Sergio. I'm from Brazil. I, I work in university and I teach uh, sociology of development. I'm from the development uh, sociology department. When I when I uh, read this uh, this um, developmentism and Dragon of Grant, Antonio de Santos, also Celso Furtado, of course, everyone has his own perspective. But uh, there is always uh, uh, I, you came up with the conclusion that their diagnosis uh, is, is a liked or, or unliked some, some political issue. And, and then you come up with the conclusion that the, the solution, the, the proposal, the political uh, way out is always a national solution. So that, that was the in, in the industrialization, substitution of, of, of imports in, in, in Latin American case well. Uh, it is, is, is there room nowadays, currently, for, for a kind of national reaction to, to this global times? That's my first question. And the second one is, has I, uh, has I have the duty to go back to my country and to teach uh, to, 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 to uh, students? I would like to uh, ask that you uh, can elaborate a little bit further on your last question about what, is, what are the challenges uh, today to, to for, for sociology of development or development studies more broadly, uh, when you when you says that um, in the past there was a matter to look at the the situations and to came up with with intervention or suggestion to go to planning to go to political and 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 today studies look more the situation make some diagnosis and just dis describe the situation. Most of my colleagues in Latin America, because of this, exactly goes to post-development, post-colonialism. Uh, that is a kind of relativism in terms of development studies. Would you? Uh, I, I would like to hear you a little bit more about uh, what you think uh, uh, on on the, on the theoretical perspective of development studies. Okay. 
Do you want to take that one now and then another sure. round? Sure. Yeah. yeah, I mean, see, these are very good questions, and I'm no longer competent, if I ever was, to respond properly to them. On the first one, uh, <coughs> it seems to me it's essential to have a national project within a global project. I mean, that's basically what I'm arguing about. Uh, it doesn't have to be a vulgar nationalist project. It doesn't have to be a xenophobic nationalist project. Uh, it, it mustn't be, in fact, those things. But it should be a balance between the degree of integration and the degree of subordination that that integration brings with it. That's my, my view. Uh, <coughs> so I think it's possible. And I think thinking about Danone versus Cadbury's is quite an interesting thing to do. I mean, this is um, one measure, it may not be ma amazing, and it's in a sense kind of ridiculous, but it's one measure of some of the latitude that governments do in fact have to secure the interests of their national populations in the context of globalization. Why should there not be a general, why should the British government not adopt the same principles as other governments of, ri of ring fencing? some industries, some sectors, from open sale. That's my first point. And <coughs> the second question is one I would love people here to answer. I'm asking myself, when I look, and I don't do work on development studies anymore, I mean on other things, but in, in the sense of that it used to be practiced, when I look at the journals, I see a, f a greatly superior degree of precision of scientific and empirical work. But I also see a loss of what I would call a kind of emotional and political, um, yes, radical uh, impulse behind it. I, I see a field that has become far more sophisticated. It had been divided into a multiplicity of subsections and subsectors, all of which are studied at a much higher level than was the case in the 60s or even the 70s or 80s. So that has happened. But what I'm asking myself, what is the, uh, what, what do people doing it want? How do they differ from people who study non-political, even non-social fields? Is there any longer behind it something that was distinctive in the early days about development studies? I don't have an answer, but I'd, I'd be interested to hear yours. Thanks, Colin. Um, Alfredo. <coughs> Try to understand the, the case that you're making. You know, when you started, I thought, there's no way this is going to provide a, an interesting explanation of Britain, but actually it does. There's, there's something very interesting there, and I like it. <coughs> Three kind of randomly picked features of the British political economy amongst the issues that you've raised. One, an ideology that started off in the period that you've covered as imperial and has morphed curiously into an extreme form of neoliberalism as a dominant ideology of the state. Second, the hegemony of finance that you described uh, as well, uh, in terms of economic policy, in terms of ideology, and, and so on. And third, the lack of industrial policy. Consistently, uh, the British state has been negligent or incompetent or unwilling, etc., to do anything uh, very much, and particularly since the Thatcher administration. Is, are these three factors sufficient to cause underdevelopment? And if they do, is it because underdevelopment is the perverse outcome of the, the hegemony of finance, the form of neoliberalism that Britain has, and the lack of industrial policy, or is this a natural and necessary outcome? of that combination of issues and policies. It's interesting the way you use the word <coughs> underdevelopment there. It seems to me that the expression of underdevelopment will vary enormously from place to place. The expression of the fact of being subject to external pressures. And <coughs> what you describe there is a country where an accumulation or a, a network of related characteristics give and produce a rather extreme form of underdevelopment, to say the exposure of this country. The way it will be represented in the OECD is it's the most open economy in the OECD. And that's another way to put it. 
is it okay to be a very open economy without any restriction on its openness and what are the socioeconomic consequences of that? I mean, the lack of an industrial policy is not is, is really a chronic feature. I mean, there have been, there were attempts in the Wilson years to have an industrial policy, and they were nixed by the Treasury uh, at birth, so we never really have had a serious industrial policy. Uh, the hegemony of finance is also not new. What is new is it's the hegemony of global finance. Um, we've got uh, Victoria, and then you. Could you say that last bit again? So I couldn't hear you very well. I, I, want to, I, uh, I would like to you could comment on the relationship between global uh, accounts and balances and the uh, and imperialism, and particularly the how do, how do we make sense of the fact that the American economy, the, the, the large or the strongest empire, is indebted? Um, and we've got a question here and then here. And you mentioned uh, the Northern powerhouse and uh, the distance between um, uh, national politicians and voters versus national politicians and finance. Um, and I just want to ask a question about the sort of deep, proper deep, meaningful devolution to local government. We're one of the most centralised countries in Europe. Only 12% of taxes are raised locally in this country. The next lowest in the European Union is just over 30%. Actually, and actually there's a growing trend for municipalisation and state-owned enterprise in local government in, in the UK. And could, do you think that could provide, with more powers devolved down, closer to, so people are more responsible to their local communities, um, with a cyclical vote, could that provide a counterbalance to the underdevelopment? That was one question. Yes, sort of, very yeah. garbled. <laughs> no, no, and, it was very good. And then, and then this one, and then you can answer those three, yeah. Um, hi, um, slightly um, unrelated, but as I know that you've written on NHS, I just want to know whether you think that um, Jeremy Hunt's uh, uh, imposition of contracts uh, to junior doctors uh, can be seen as a step to change or disrupt or even privatize energies? All good questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, what is the core? I think, that's, I think I said, but I probably didn't say it clearly enough, that I think that is the big shift from Frank's perspective. And it's not, not obvious to me what consequences will flow from that. But clearly, they will. Although the United States is the predominant owner of the capital invested in this country, it's by no means an exclusive one. In other words, we're no longer talking about a geographical core and its per and, uh, periphery related to that core. We're talking about a global, uh, a global class of capital owners, which in some respects does act like a class, has class-like characteristics, has connections, has uh, institutions through which it operates, but nonetheless is not located in any one place. I mean, the point about uh, Tata owning Land Rover is case in point. So. Uh, I don't think we, I think that is an important shift. The question is, is underdevelopment by global capital different in its impact and its consequences for any given country than underdevelopment at the hands of a, a, a single metropolis? And I'm not sure of the answer to that. I think case by case, you'd have to ask that question. Um, on the question of the de indebtedness of the United States and its uh, imperial role at the moment, um, I'm not quite sure that the question is, is its indebtedness, uh, what is it, what, could you repeat it exactly? What? It seems like you were saying that indebtedness is an important feature of underdevelopment. I did say that, but I said it's true for uh, countries which, <coughs> which, I mean, the United States has special resources, right, which we know, 
which allow it to acquire this debt without paying the consequences. It's unusual in this respect. Uh, similar things sort of apply to oil states on a very different scale and with very different consequences, but most countries that substantial debts are subject to the pressures that, that Streak describes. And, and that would be the distinction that I would make for, for the United States. Uh, devolution. There you are. Uh, if you can imagine any future British government being serious about devolution, then my answer would be, yes, I think that could be an enormously important break on what has actually been happening, the indifference to the social consequences of foreign ownership of productive assets. I think that is obviously true. But the trend has been so relentlessly the other way. And although the present government is talking about running down, abolishing state grants to local authorities, for example, and handing over the business rates, which is another, of course, poison chalice because business rates vary so dramatically and are typically good in areas that don't need them uh, and feeble in areas that are very deprived. But so my, my feeling is that that's not going to happen. We're going to get a nominal devolution, which is in fact a delegation and is in fact a way of shifting the state out of a lot of responsibilities that it still retains from the welfare state era. That, to me, is the thrust of policy, but I completely agree that in a, in a reformed, <coughs> in a country with a decent constitution, which we don't have, that all of those measures would be fought over and probably reversed. I mean, I think popular support could be mo motivated, could be mobilized to, to resist that. As for Jeremy Hunt, um, I don't know the answer. Who, who, is, who is it asking you to? I don't know the answer. I was telling uh, Faisy beforehand that I had an interesting conversation yesterday with John Lister, who's a leading expert on health services in London. And London is now being told, or has been told, uh, just before Christmas, that it will have a devolution like Manchester has been told. Um, how did that come about? Well, Hunt told them. How did that happen? Because the Health and Social Care Act does not put charge in Hunt of providing the health service. Well, it's happening because Hunt controls the purse strings to the sort of slush fund that the Treasury makes available for bailing out little bits of the health service as they fall into ever more acute deficits because we've got, <coughs> we've got static revenue and growing demand, so it's totally stretched. And because it's been compartmentalized into trusts, which each have to balance their books individually, this gives Hunt the leverage to tell people to do things, which according to the legislation, he doesn't have power he doesn't have, but that's the way it's working. Uh, why did he impose the contract? I think it was a virility test. <laughs> I cannot see any benefit to him in having done that. But having said he might do it, it seems to me that within the party, at least, it became important for him to do it. And I'm baffled as to what the uh, end game plan is for the crisis that is being inflicted on the NHS. So I can't answer your question. I have no special insight. And the person I hope to tell me yesterday hasn't either. Other questions?
enjoy this global capital to gain ground because we're thinking of even Sweden is thinking it's secure and safe. Uh, so energy, forests are all being sold out in a similar fashion, but it's never talked about. So I'm wondering if the EU project might have given some sort of false security to allow for such uh, internal, internalized, internationalization of capital. So the EU would create a sense of false security? Well, of, the, of so many decades of peace, whether ah. or not the issue of national security has kind of just been removed. Um, <coughs> let me think about that. On the question... Also in the context of TTIP, because that's, you know, being negotiated at an EU level. Okay, let me deal with this one first and then come back. I mean, I can't deal with it, but I mean, it's... We have to distinguish between the EU as an idea and an organization and the people who are currently running it and the ideology which is hegemonic within the EU. And, you know, if you, if you think of the EU as represented by the leaders who faced down Syriza in Greece, um, this is not this is not the EU that, as it was conceived and as it, you know, the, the Eurozone crisis and the EU need to be seen as two potentially separable things and there are a number of movements afoot at the moment to reassert the original conception of the EU and to democratize it and there is a new organization called uh, <coughs> Democracy in Europe 25 Democracy in Europe Movement 25 that's just been founded by Yanis Varoufakis and others <coughs> to precisely do that. And its slogan is, the EU will be democratized or it will disintegrate. And I think there's a good case can be made for saying that that is, like, that is unfortunately true. So while it once may have created a sense of problems being taken care of within which corporate uh, power was a relatively unchecked. I don't think that's the case in post post Greece last year. It doesn't seem to me to be the case anymore. People are now alert to the real character of the power that's being exercised, at least <coughs> within the eurozone, which is nearly all of the EU, of course. So yeah, as for, um, I like. I mean, I think the idea of looking at the world as a set of corporate economies. Uh, corporatistic or joint corporate economies is important. I mean, <coughs> it's sobering to think that if you had to have an industrial strategy in this country tomorrow, there is very few civil servants left who could implement it, who could design it and implement it. The planning capacity in the state is very, very limited. It's almost gone because you're not trained to be planners. It's not okay to be planners. Planning is out. The planning capacity in Amazon or Microsoft is massive. So, yes, I mean, I think an optic where you started from what are the plans of a number of dominant corporations that are operating in a particular economy and thought about what that means for that economy would be a very interesting project. Why not? I agree and, with that. And we've got one over there. Uh, just, uh, to bring back so can you speak up just a little? Yeah. The fundamental issue he's arguing is it's a relational. Uh, we're talking about underdevelopment on one side and enrichment on the other. So can't we more fruitfully bring in, in his insights to say what we've got is an acute case of continuing overdevelopment? Uh, in the sense that all the characteristics of the domination of finance, the decline of industry, are, are actually acute expressions of a continuing form of uh, overdevelopment. In the sense that there is still surplus value coming to Britain, and it's you know, it, it, I mean, it's not hard to show that actually, if you, if you ask that question, right? I mean, Britain is still a rich country. We still have a welfare state and so on and so forth, right? In the social sense, it's hardly comparable at all to an underdeveloped country. And it's slightly 
uh, mor morally um, tendentious to suggest that we are, yeah? in my view, right, to bring back the radicalness of development studies. So what I'm tr trying to say is maybe rather than a sort of a, a direct switch saying, okay, there's certain characteristics which we can have, right, shouldn't we also be analysing the condition of overdevelopment as well as underdevelopment and what that has brought this country? I'm not sure whether this is a, <coughs> a problem of semantics because, <coughs> I mean, to me, it's difficult to argue that Frank means anything except subordinate development in, in, in both an economic and a political sense. So what would overdevelopment in your usage mean? It would be, it would be a, a reassertion or the, the claim would be that we continue to be an underdeveloper of other countries. Is that is that's the implication? Yeah, that's part of the argument. Yeah. We as a country, I'm not sure that that is true, though clearly uh, British capital is involved in doing that in a number of countries. As I said, I can't, I'm, I'm not clear that the, the balance of asset, of capital, of uh, profit flows from that is, is a net one to this country anymore. It's, it's not clear to me, but you could perhaps show that it is, yeah. Okay. The question with would be why do we run such a massive current account deficit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are there any other um, last questions? Okay, yeah. Where do you see China in all of this as underdeveloping, developing, sober developing? I feel like it's quite an emerging power, and yet it's not quite considered to be an overarching kind of core or, yeah. Um. Do you want to answer that as a last question? Yeah, well, <coughs> clearly it's in, a, it's in a transition. I mean, it would be ridiculous to say it is one thing rather than another. I mean, it is tra in transition towards uh, a fully capitalist society. Um, it is present. There's a huge amount of production there that is by foreign companies, but uh, so there is a, there, are, there are in some senses being under, but being underdeveloped at, at the level of surplus transfer surplus outflows that are taking place. But what the most striking thing about China is that it's very nationalist project uh, with in investment of over thir a third of the national income um, for for national for nationalist if you like for, for national aims um, which is absolutely unlike anything that is exactly what uh, the early dependency theorists and the development theorists wanted to happen not necessarily with a Chinese communist style party leadership uh, government, but it's very much what, what they hoped. So it, I would say it's in their language, it's not an underdeveloping country, it's a very much a developing country. Yeah. I just wanted to thank Colin then for that um, wonderful um, talk. Um, and just to say that next week, um, same time, uh, same place, five o'clock in this room, um, we're going to have D Dr. Gabriel Palmer from Cambridge on why is inequality so unequal across the world. Sorry that we had to switch those two just for um, unforeseen circumstances, but um, do join us next week. And also we're going to have a reception now in the SCR, so you're more than welcome to join us then. Thanks. Uh, if, if anyone's left a national rail card, you can come and get it here. Oh, I know whose it is. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs>